Growing up in Australia in the 90s, you had to really take what you got when it came to JRPGs, as many of them didn't come to PAL territories, despite receiving attention and good sales in the West. Of the few that I do remember playing as a kid, Breath of Fire 2 always came up with a tinge of fondness, so I was really excited to revisit it. Breath of Fire 2 was released on the Super Famicom in Japan in 1994, NTSC regions on the Super Nintendo Entertainment System in 1995, and PAL regions in 1996. The game also received a Game Boy Advance release, and appears on the Nintendo Switch within the Nintendo Online service. Were my memories of playing the game as a kid skewed by the fact that the JRPG library offering on the SNES was limited in Australia? Or is the game one that is worthy of being played today? Let's find out. For the purposes of this review, I played the game on the Switch Nintendo Online service, which is a direct port of the original SNES version. After an anonymous demonic eye demands us to pray to God to give him strength, we are placed into the shoes of Yu, a young boy from the village of Gate, who lives with his father and sister in a modest church within the town. What I enjoyed about this section of the game is that it begins in black and white, indicating that this is the past. One day, Yu's sister Yua goes missing, and he finds her taking a nap beneath a large dragon who has sealed a cave within the mountains behind the village. Upon his sister insisting that he too take a nap, Ryu complies, but rather than dreaming of his mother, like Yua implied, he sees the demon eye. When he awakens, he returns to Gate to find that his relatives are gone, and no one in the village recognises him. Taken under the care of the pastor of the local church, he later leaves with another youth called Bo, who convinces him into a life of thievery. The two take shelter in a nearby cave to avoid a lashing storm, where they unexpectedly encounter a large demon that knocks them both unconscious. Years pass, and the game resumes with the two boys, now teenagers, working for a mercenary guild in hometown. It's from here that the journey begins. One thing that I enjoyed about the game was that, like the first game, rather than human characters, the cast is comprised mostly of anthropomorphic humanoids that sets the game apart from other games of the era. I always enjoyed meeting the various tribes and encountering the different abilities that they possessed based on their race. Each character has a unique field skill that can be used when traversing the world. For example, Yu can fish, Kat can go hunting and she can also destroy boulders with her staff, Jean can swim in lakes and rivers, and Spa can walk through forests. You will need to make use of the different field skills in order to navigate the world and complete your quest. Not too far into the game you will encounter a rundown shack in your investigation of the disappearance of a girl's precious pet. This shack serves later as a home base, which is not only a camp for your characters, where they will talk to you about various events of the game as you progress, but you can also recruit a number of NPCs, once you expand the base into a town, who can then offer you their services. As a kid, this was my first encounter with a game that had such a feature, and it soon became one of my favourite features of an RPG. Any game that has a home base that you can grow, and return to, always has a place in my heart. What's more, you have some degree of control over the base, starting from the carpenter that you select to build the town, which determines the style of housing, to the NPCs that you recruit. Though unfortunately once you invite someone, unlike in Animal Crossing, you cannot dismiss them. One thing that struck me strongly with this game is its theme of suspicion which permeates the entire narrative. From the beginning where you're wondering how it's possible for the local villagers of Gate to forget who you are, to the various characters that are either impersonating someone else for their own personal gain, or conducting nefarious activities that, once highlighted, serve to show the depth of corruption in the world. Throughout the whole adventure you'll be continuously suspicious of the characters that you meet, especially if they are associated with the prolific Church of Eva. God needs more strength. Pray, Pray to God. God. Give him your faith. Subscribe to the Idiots of God, for there is no other way like the teachings of God, for they will show you the way. Share the teachings of God, so that his form may become whole. Comment on the Idiots of God, so that you may better understand your soul. Give yourself to God.
Give him your life! As you explore, you will inevitably encounter one of the more egregious elements of the game, the encounter system combined with the difficult battles that aren't easy to breeze through. There is no easy way around saying that this is one of the worst random encounter systems I have ever experienced. You take a few steps, and you are suddenly in a battle. Take a few more, and another battle occurs. Running away is also unreliable, so if you try that strategy, you'll soon find your party members wasting away as corpses on the ground, because their feet were cemented in place like at a shanty bar that has had sticky alcohol spilt on the floor, preventing easy movement. Like the first game, there is a means to reduce the encounter rate, but it doesn't seem to work all that well. In fact, in some instances, it seems to make the encounter rate worse. You can somewhat tell the frequency of encounters from the dancing creature at the top of the field menu screen. If it's sleeping, there are no encounters, though if it's red and thrashing about like it's a baby having a tantrum, which sometimes happens when you use the smoke ability, then you're going to be in for a world of pain. Battles themselves are also more difficult than those encountered in the first game. Some enemy encounters are so unfair, or drawn out in a way that only pads out the gameplay time. For example, the harpies in Tag Woods will always heal themselves for more than you can damage them, making you waste time continuously wailing on them until they run out of AP. Other monsters have an ability that can put your whole party to sleep with no way to combat it. If a character is inflicted with sleep, they will not wake up until they are struck. And I must also mention the zombie ability, which strikes a character with a sickness that turns them into a zombie within two turns if they are not cured, and the battle isn't concluded before then. If your whole team turns into zombies, then it's a wipe. Though for all the difficulty the game presents, I must say that at least it is somewhat fair in allowing you to retain all your experience when you die, and you are returned to the last place you saved, albeit with a large portion of your cash missing. The cast of the adventure is quite robust visually, but I can't really say the same thing when it comes to combat, which is something that the first game also suffered from. Characters like Nina, Pat, or Rand become necessary in order to get anywhere due to their magic, speed, and strength. If you happen to use a character that is underleveled, or not wearing the right equipment for the situation that you are in, they will only end up being a liability. I found this with both Jean and Spa early in the game, though admittedly I did take Spa into the final dungeon and beat the game with them in my party, so if you are willing to work on the weaker characters, they can become useful, but it is a bit of a slog. I should also note that the maximum party size is 4, and once you have determined your party, you cannot change it unless you speak to a dragon statue or a church pastor. After battle, you will receive experience that will go toward leveling the characters up. As they level, they may learn magic skills that will aid in changing the tide of battle. This is the only way in which characters will develop naturally. Also, the figure for experience given at the end of a battle is the total amount that the whole party received, so to understand each party member's allotment, you need to divide that figure by the number of party members that were alive when the battle ended. Also, it can take a long time to level up. Some characters, like you, have a much higher threshold that they need to reach in order to gain a level. I thought this was a little unfair initially, but when I realised how Yu functions, I changed my mind. So Yu, being a member of the Dragon Clan, will eventually gain the ability to transform into a dragon, which sounds great in concept. However, this time around, the execution of the ability is very lacking. Where the previous game allowed you to transform and sustain a dragon form, Breath of Fire 2's Yu has a skill more akin to a summoner from the Final Fantasy series. Ryu innately has a lower AP pool than almost everyone else in the game. It seems unfair at first when considering that he learns some healing spells that are useful in the earlier stages of the game. However, Ryu's dragon ability consumes all of his AP, but that's not all. The damage that his dragon form does is calculated based upon the difference between his max and current AP. For example, if you use his best dragon ability, G-Dragon, at full AP, it will always do 999 damage. However, if even a portion of that AP pool is missing, the damage will be calculated at less. I felt that this was pretty cheap and unfair, and I really didn't like it. In the original Breath of Fire, Khan could fuse with other characters in the party using his AP to become stronger and also grant different field skills. Breath of Fire 2 also does have a fusion system, but it is very different. 
Around the time Yu learns of his ability to transform into a dragon, you'll meet an old lady who specialises in fusing shamans. She will demand to be taken to your village as compensation for destroying her house, and decides to set up a shop there. Once she has established herself, she will offer to fuse shamans that you find around the world with your various characters, excepting you. There are 8 shamans in total, and up to 2 can be fused to a character at a time. Some fusions result in better statistics, while some others can completely change the appearance of your character. I did enjoy the fusion system, until I discovered its limitations. If a fused character gets to near critical health in battle, or they die, they lose the fusion with no immediate way to restore it. The game also offers battle formations that you can choose from the menu to change the placement of your characters in battle, however one problem with this was that every time your party number changed, whether it be by your own doing or not, the formation always reverted back to the default. I found this annoying especially when leaving your home base, as your characters leave your party and then re-enter it naturally. There were also a couple of battles where this happened too, which was extremely frustrating. It's important to note that when you do change your battle formation, it also changes the statistics of the characters placed into different positions, which is why it's an advantage to experiment with them. On a more positive note, the themes and the story of the game is one that I really enjoyed, even returning to it as an adult. At the time the game was first released, the heavy religious themes, and that of religion being corrupt, was something that hadn't really been explored in games in great depth, so it was refreshing at the time to have a game that told a story based on the dangers of blind faith, which is something that could easily be reflected into our own world. The game does get dark in some places, and may have you tear up at the direction that the story sometimes takes, though a small barrier to the game may be its localization. Capcom decided to translate the game itself without outsourcing, and the quality in the translation compared to the first game really shows. There are a ton of grammar mishaps, misspellings, mistranslations of enemy names, and even instances where a yes option is actually the no option. In critical areas of the game, this really became problematic, and actually messed up part of my playthrough at the point where you have to go into the well to save the villagers of the carpenter's town. And what the hell is an egg beater? One of the other features of the game that I thought was a nice addition and kind of wished was explored more was the dragon talisman. In some conversations with other characters, Ryu's mother's talisman will appear with the gem in the center at the side of the dialogue box. The color of the gem indicates the nature of the character's heart, with black being that of malice, and a flashing rainbow representative of the faith and trust that the character has in you. It was mostly used in instances when you encountered humans that had been turned into demons, and I liked that it highlighted the blacknesses of their heart. The field graphics aren't really anything to comment on, nothing was really done to push the technology, though I did like instances where, say, a building collapsed, which was animated well. The battle graphics, however, really highlight what the developers were capable of in terms of pixel art, from characters' idle animations to the detail put into the enemy attack animations. The battle backdrops are also lovingly detailed and animated, such as a cave that has a trickling stream, to a network of caves where the walls are laced with flashing machinery. Previously, before I'd replayed this game, I had believed that the music of Breath of Fire 2 was superior to that of its predecessor, however replaying it, I now find that that's not the case. There are some great tracks to be sure, but the limited number of dungeon tracks really hurt this title. The dungeon theme is almost always the same, short, repeating, creepy tune that had its appeal at the beginning, but quickly outdid its welcome. My favourite track is called The Flower. It plays later in the game in the same grassy area behind the village of Gate that you first found you are in. At a time when the world is on the brink of turmoil, it is a peaceful tune that promises the protection of the Dragon Clan from the encroaching demon threat. Perhaps it's a tune that even young you are napped to. Breath of Fire 2 is a diamond encrusted within centuries of coal. Some people may have the patience to chip away and find that gem, whilst others would be put off by the elements that ultimately make the game enjoyable to play. The unique, for the time, theme of corrupt religion was something that a younger me appreciated, but these days I find that this theme has since been done better in other titles. The permeating theme of suspicion may keep you on the edge of your seat, if you can get past the bad localization, but ultimately you may find yourself losing interest because of the constant unfair battles that you are thrust into, with the culmination of a huge difficulty spike in the final dungeon. If you haven't played this game, then it's probably better to watch someone else suffer through it via a let's play, 
or look up the plot on Wikipedia, as unless you're a masochist, or a very patient person, I can guarantee that you will most likely not enjoy this game. By the way, are there any games that you remember fondly but find them difficult to return to these days? Let me know in the comments! This has been Venmar with a review of Breath of Fire 2 for the Super Nintendo Entertainment System. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe for more great JRPG content. As always, thanks for watching and I look forward to seeing you all again next time. Take care and bye bye for now! Thank you.